There's a Good evening, everybody. We're going to try to get started. Uh, there are a few isolated seats uh, in the auditorium. If there's a seat open next to you, please put up your hand. Okay, people at the back, you can see where people have their hands up. For those of you who can't find a seat in the auditorium, I'm afraid you'll have to take a seat in the, in the foyer. We can't have people sitting in the aisles. So I'm going to give people a few minutes to find a seat. Uh, we still have people coming in the front gate. Uh, so, but I don't want to keep up those of you who are timely. Uh, that's for sure. You need a bigger room? Okay, so uh, any other open seats? Okay, so I apologize to those who can't find a seat. There are seats in the foyer and there is a screen, so you will be able to both hear and, and see uh, the transparencies. So good evening. Uh, uh, can everybody hear me? Uh, welcome to the Stanford Linear Accelerator Center. Uh, a warm welcome to you all. Very pleased to see you here. Very pleased that people have found our public lecture series to be so interesting. Uh, we are filling this hall every time we have this lecture, which is very heartwarming. Uh, you're at SLAC. Uh, SLAC is the Department of Energy Science Laboratory. It is uh, run by the Department of Energy by Stanford University, who are the contractor. So uh, SLAC is part of Stanford University. The research that is performed here is all in the open public domain. We don't do anything that is classified. We do everything in the public domain. And researchers from around the world, around 3,000 of them from 30 different nations, propose and join experiments, use the facilities at this laboratory to conduct their research. Research in three main areas. One is using accelerators to study the the structure of matter at very, very small distances. Uh, we use accelerators to create very intense beams of x-rays so we can study materials, we can study biological systems, we can study all manner of materials where x-rays penetrate. And then we have re recently gotten into the business of particle astrophysics and cosmology, which is the exciting subject you'll hear about this evening. The physics of studying matter at the smaller and smaller scales takes us back to earlier and earlier times, uh, and that is earlier and earlier times in our cosmos. And so the study of the structure of matter and the study of our cosmos are intertwinably the same study. And as we've gone to higher energies, to smaller subjects, we get to earlier and earlier times, and these two fields simply have become an overlapping field and uh, a very exciting time. Didn't introduce myself. My name is Jonathan Dorf, and I'm the director of this laboratory. We're very privileged this evening to have a distinguished speaker, Roger Blanford, professor here at Stanford, holder of the Chen Chair, director of the newly uh, started Kavli Institute for Particle Astrophysics and Cosmology. Uh, Roger is a very distinguished member of the international community of scientists, a theorist, a prominent researcher, a very influential leader in the world of particle astrophysics and cosmology. We were very fortunate a year and a half ago to attract him away from Caltech, bring him here to Stanford to head our new Kavli Institute of Particle Astrophysics and Cosmology. I think you'll have a great time listening to Roger's lecture tonight. The lecture comes at an extraordinary time in our history a time in which we're learning things about our cosmos that we didn't dream about maybe even five years ago. You're all familiar with the luminous aspects of our cosmos, the things you can see, the stars, the things you capture with your eye when you look up. 
Many of you probably know that we've known for some time that there's a large fraction of our universe that's dark. It does not luminous. We don't see it. We sense it. It's out there. That's one of the mysteries we're chasing. What is the dark matter in our universe? But recently we found yet another conundrum of extraordinary proportions. We found that our universe at its outer edges is expanding, but it's accelerating in its expansion. Now, what holds the universe together? Well, gravity holds the universe together. If the outer nethers of the universe are expanding increasingly, something is winning the tug of war against gravity. We don't know what it is. It's this conundrum and others that I've mentioned that Roger will focus on with his lecture tonight. I'm very pleased to welcome Roger Blanford. Well, thank you very much, Jonathan, and thank you very much uh, to you and all your colleagues here at Stanford uh, for your uh, warm welcome to my colleagues and myself uh, in the 15 months that we've been here in the Stanford community. What I'd like to do in this talk is discuss three propositions. That the universe is flat, that it is accelerating, and that it's lightweight. And what I'd like to do in this talk is to try and explain to you, firstly, what these words mean in this context, how we know these statements to be true or think that they're true, and then I'd like to go on to say why this might be so and what we must do next to understand more about the universe as we've discovered it to be over the last uh, five years or so. So let's just start off with the first proposition that the universe is flat. Many of you will have memories, perhaps not too pleasant, of high school geometry. You did know there's a three-hour exam after this. <laughs> we'll take up your scripts at the, at the your exam papers at the end. Okay, some of these names may be familiar to you. Uh, Eudoxus and Apollonius, two of the greatest Greek geometers. And then Euclid, who, although not one of the greatest geometers, was one of the greatest teachers and textbook writers. And they proved a, uh, many theorems, and one of them, which is, say, in a language, a slightly more modern language, is that the sum of the angles inside a triangle like this on a piece of paper is two right angles, or 180 degrees, as we'd say now. Now, what, one of the things that Euclid did was to, um, in writing his book, was to recognize something slightly curious. It's known as Euclid's fifth postulate. The Greeks, as you know, were very keen on logic. They were very keen on deriving results from assumptions. And he recognized that there was something that he could not prove from elementary principles and was, in fact, a postulate. And that, an axiom, a hypothesis, if you like. And I state in a very uh, sort of joc almost jocular sense, rather than the precise mathematical language, we might say that parallel lines meet at infinity. And he recognized, to his great credit, that that was an assumption. Now, if we adopt this, we can generalize. We can use all the geometry on a piece of paper that Euclid and his contemporaries de derived and go into a third dimension. The piece of paper is two dimensions, we go off into a third dimension. We call this three-dimensional Euclidean geometry. And this is something that is used without thinking by engineers and architects uh, in their everyday work. Here is the a uh, computer-generated image of the Fred Cavley building, which is now under construction, just on the other side of the green outside. And this is what we hope it will look like in about 15 months. Now, the architect, Steve Dangerman, I don't think he wakes up every morning in a cold sweat wondering, well, is Euclid's fifth postulate right? Uh, will my buildings fall down? I doubt if he's ever heard of Euclid's fifth postulate, but his computer programs probably haven't either. But he, he nevertheless builds buildings. Well, I've seen them, they're square, and so on. And I hope this one will be. So, um, 
But there is a possibility that we could say that Euclid's fifth postulate was wrong and then see where we would go. And the Greeks, who were very logical, would very much approve of us exploring this possibility. Just to give you an inkling of what I'm on about, just consider here a very simple sketch of the Earth. Imagine this is a three-dimensional globe, and I could have done it this way, but you can imagine it on, in two dimensions. And imagine an excursion by car and boat on the surface of the Earth. No aviators or miners involved in this experiment. Go from the North Pole to a point in the equator, go along the equator, and then return along a line of longitude back to the North Pole. We regard those on the surface, the two-dimensional surface of the Earth, as straight lines. They're the shortest distances between points. And if we add up the angles in that triangle, we find that they're not equal to two right angles, but three right angles are 270 degrees. This is a geometry that you might think is cheating, but it is a geometry that violates the assumptions of Euclid's um, uh, fifth postulate. And the reason why is because the surface of the Earth is curved. And the man who, in some sense, understood all of this amongst the Greek geometers is Archimedes. Archimedes, who you may think of just as the Eureka Streaker, <laughs> but I think of as one of the three great mathematicians of history. A man whose independent thoughts and achievements, and those that we know of, and there are many that were probably lost, uh, place him as a mind in, the, in, the modern, in, in with the moderns. And one of the things that he understood extremely well was the geometry of a sphere. In fact, to do this, he was using differential and integral calculus uh, nearly 2,000 years before it was reinvented by Newton, Leibniz and others. So, the key point here is then, is that we have a different type of geometry on the surface of a sphere where there's a whole lot of different theorems. And so you'd have to go back to school and learn them all over again. Okay, Archimedes, I might mention parenthetically, um, was, the son, was a mathematician. He was most proud to be a mathematician. He was also an engineer. But he was, I can say with pride, the son of an astronomer. <laughs> which uh, at least substantiates our claim that we belong to the world's second oldest profession. <laughs> <laughs> now all of this may be cheating. Because it's just a sphere in three dimensions, in flat Euclidean three-dimensional space. But it isn't. There's a really big idea here. If we go back to our two-dimensional geometry on a piece of paper, we can imagine two ants crawling along their parallel lines and never meeting. They won't get to infinity. They'll get exhausted. But, they'll, but they will never meet on their parallel lines. If we went to the surface of a sphere, here shown appropriately enough tonight as a baseball, then they will find positive curvature and they will meet. It's different. <laughs> If we went onto the surface of a saddle, we'd find negative curvature. And they wouldn't meet. In fact, there are many lines that won't meet. Now, the big idea is that you can construct logically and incontrovertibly two-dimensional surfaces that are curved, like the ones I've sketched here, that cannot exist in three-dimensional space. They cannot sit in three-dimensional space. And yet they exist. And that was a remarkable discovery. There were many people who made it in the 19th century. And one of them, for those of you who are old enough to uh, recall Tom Lehrer, is Lobachevsky. And he, uh, in fact, will turn up a little again in this picture. But actually, Lobachevsky was almost certainly anticipated by another uh, mathematician, the second of the three great mathematicians of, of history will meet, Carl Friedrich Gauss. And what, here he is on a, on a banknote, a German banknote, no longer in use, of course. And, um, and he actually not only realized that there was a possibility of non-Euclidean geometry, but he actually asked the question, well, is it really true that the space in which we live is flat? And so the story is that he went out to the local mountains near Brunswick, the Hartz Mountains, 
and he went and surveyed them. Now, in practice, he almost certainly didn't do any of these things. He just sat in his office, and somebody else went off and surveyed them. <laughs> and he sat in his office, and then he, had, he was a very good mathematician, so he could add up the angles in the inside of the, this triangle. And uh, he uh, found they got 180 degrees. So he proved that at least on the side scale of Germany, and who cared if they had anything bigger than that, uh, the... <laughs> Some of this, is it there we go. Uh, the sum of the um, angles was, whoops. Um, so the sum of the angles was 180 degrees. And so it looked like it was flat. In fact, you'd have had to have much more accurate surveying equipment than we can even muster today to show the small amounts of curvature that are in practice there. At any rate, this was my sort of preamble to explain what it meant to something to be flat. And it's a question that we can ask, like Gauss did, but as Albachevsky himself actually suggested, of the universe at large. We can ask if triangles in our universe at large, if the sum of the angles really adds up to 180 degrees, or all the other properties that go with being flat. And you might think this is a pretty dumb question, because uh, that's a reasonable thing to assume. Um, but for a long while, us astronomers, cosmologists, and physicists really did believe the universe was not flat, that it was negatively curved. But the experiment has recently been performed. It's been performed by looking at the microwave background. As I'm sure all of you know, the microwave background is a relic radiation from the Big Bang that we look at from a time when the universe was a third of a million years old, instead of the 14 billion years old that the universe is today. And if we look at the microwave background, a small patch of the sky looks like this. And what we see are features of a certain preferred size. You can see them here. In practice, this is about the same size as the full moon you can see outside tonight. So you see these features, and they constitute a measuring rod. And we can calculate how big that measuring rod is, and we can look at it with light rays that come from, us, come from it to us. And the most recent and most accurate determinations have been done by a satellite called WMAP that's in orbit as we speak, making measurements. And we have here, it's essentially forming a triangle. And by adding up in a special way, there's a, lot, there's a lot more to it than this, of course, but this is the essence of what's going on. By adding up the angles inside this triangle, we can actually perform the test and see if the universe is flat. And what we have discovered is to about 2% accuracy, the universe is flat. So there's a little bit of an irony here. If we go back to the days of Columbus and his much famed sailor, uh, sailors, they thought the, the world was flat and they were going to sail over the edge of it and it turned out to be curved. By contrast, us astronomers thought the universe was curved and it turned out to be flat. So you shouldn't treat, trust anybody. <laughs> I might also mention, like many other measurements that I could make, this is a real theory of experimental tour de force. These fluctuations that you see here are a few parts per million. It's almost completely smooth. They're tiny fluctuations, and you need very sensitive telescopes. It take 40 years to get to this point, but it's been a remarkable accomplishment to make these measurements. So, we said the universe is flat. Now let's turn to the second proposition, that it's accelerating. I must go back again to the beginning and discuss how things move. Well, this was again a problem that, uh, that intrigued the, the Greeks. Aristotle, who although he is known to ethicists and philosophers and so on as one of the great savants of antiquity, is known to physicists for having got almost everything wrong. <laughs> and one of the things that he said was that things, arrows and stones and so on, kept on going because they were pushed and the air sort of rushed behind and kept on pushing it. And lots of other sort of very strange ideas. Now, the person who is credited with, and he, he, he essentially ruled the roost for uh, 1,800 years or so. So the person who is sort of credited with having 
set us on the right track, although earlier people, in fact, had got the right idea too, was Galileo. But Galileo and his young man was a follower of Aristotle, a scholastic, as they were called. Here he is again on an Italian banknote. You see, there's money in physics, so <laughs> you can... But I don't use it anymore. It's no good to you. <coughs> Do a milia. Yeah. Okay. Now, what he said was, if he dropped something on the floor, like that, uh, that's, not a, that's what happened to you sometimes, um, drop this on the floor like that, I might want to eat this, um, then he said that in his scholastic phase, that the speed with which that apple or the stone or whatever it was would fall increased in proportion to the distance. Now he deduced this law by pure thought. It's a quite clever argument, not a very clever argument, and it's just plain wrong. But nonetheless, he did this by pure thought. He was a theorist, like me, you see. Now, but to our Galileo's eternal credit, he didn't stop there. He realized that he had the opportunity, as indeed others before him had, to perform a measurement. He realized that he could drop a cannonball or some other body from the Leaning Tower of Pisa. Now, I suspect that, like many of these other tales, this never actually happened. He was just trying to explain to people what he had in mind, or maybe somebody else did it. But he performed the we do know he performed the equivalent experiments. And what he found was, and I'm probably oversimplifying slightly here, is that in falling one floor, the cannonball um, uh, takes one second. But in falling... There we go. In falling four floors, it takes two seconds. And if you think about it for a moment, what this is saying is that the speed increases in proportion to the time. If we double the time, we double the speed. Not double the distance and double the speed. And so this is Galileo the scientist. This is what he said. And this was, in fact, one of, regarded as one of the sort of turning points in the development of science in the Renaissance because it showed how you could really get the important, correct and useful answer by performing the experiment rather than just by thinking about it. So just to reinforce this point, if we look at the experiment and look at Aristotle's theory, there really is a difference. If we make them synchronized, say, at the bottom of the first, of the first rule from the top, then you can see at one second, two sec, what, excuse me, uh, let's go back again. Uh, one second, uh, after one second and after two seconds, we're uh, first floor and then the fourth floor, in, in truth, in experiment, but in Aristotle's <coughs> argument, where the speed increased in proportion to the distance, we fall from there to there in one second, and from here all the way down to the bottom, it turns out in two seconds. And he was able to distinguish that. So that's very important, and that's very, all part of the expanding process of the scientific process. Now, now let's try and apply some of these ideas to the universe. The universe, as you know, is expanding. A discovery that was made, or quantified at least, by Edwin Hubble, shown here, smoking his pipe, uh, and he essentially said that if we look at nearby galaxies and measure their speeds and measure their distances, then the speed goes as the distance. This is known as Hubble's law. How do astronomers, in practice, measure speed and measure distance? You can't sort of go out there with a stopwatch or something like that, at least I don't think you can. Um, watch late night TV, you may get different ideas, but there you go. Um, so what, one of the, there are many ways that astronomers use to measure distances. One of the ones that's proving, somewhat surprisingly, to be the most effective is to look at supernova explosions. And basically, distant galaxies have explosions of old stars which make them shine bright, almost as bright as a galaxy, for a month or so, and then fade. And by measuring the brightness of that supernova explosion, there you see it, and now you see it's now you'll see it fading again. By measuring the brightness of that supernova explosion, then you know what the luminosity is, you measure how much energy comes into a telescope now, that gives you a measure of the distance. 
If you imagine somebody with a flashlight and they stand 10 foot away from you, the flashlight looks very bright. If they stand 20 foot away from you, it's four times fainter. And it's that effect that astronomers are using to measure the distance. How do astronomers measure speed? Well, what they do then is they use an effect called the Doppler effect. To explain this, I should remind you that light is, as you see visually, is decomposed into colors. Here, a good example is the rainbow, from red to violet. And this is the spectrum. Now, that, of course, is, is ultimately a solar spectrum. And if you look at the solar spectrum with a very sensitive instrument, you will see, as you see from many cosmic objects, that in fact it isn't a continuous gradation of color from the red to the violet, but you can see a lot of very special lines in there, very special wavelengths that correspond to the wavelengths of light that are emitted by certain atoms like hydrogen. And the wavelength of the light is lengthened if the source of the light recedes from us. This is known as the redshift. And the whole effect is called the Doppler effect. And it may be familiar to those of you who've been um, chased by police on the freeway or whatever. And then your police car comes up behind you, and you hear a, a high pitch as it's approaching towards you, and then it's not you they're chasing, they go straight past, and then you hear a low pitch as it goes past you. That's the sound version of this. Astronomers use the light version, because sound doesn't do too well in intergalactic space, so they use the light version and the light version uh, gives you a shift in the, um, how we do, that one, that one, there we go, uh, from the short wave to the long wavelengths, it gives you a shift. And what we have here, this is the comparison spectrum at the telescope, and here's one particular spectral line, it's a line of hydrogen, associated with hydrogen atoms, and then it's shifted towards the red by this amount here, this is a measure of the spectrum, so that amount there, and by measuring that, you can tell, a, tell how far away that, uh, tell the receding speed, so the recession speed of the source. And this is a very famous spectrum. It's the first one that was used to find the very first quasar. So that's how astronomers measure speed. The Doppler shift. So let's just uh, show you what the expanding universe in a very amateurish simulation might look like. We have that, focus on that white galaxy in the middle, and we can see the other galaxies moving away from it like that. So we, as we saw the universe expand, we actually saw the distance between this white galaxy and that blue galaxy more or less double, as you can see here. So at the start to the end, the distance doubled. Then there's a yellow galaxy you can just see there, and you can see down there, it's a rather faint one. And that distance has also doubled. So what happened is the yellow galaxy is t at all times twice as far away as the blue galaxy. And the blue galaxy doubles its distance, the yellow galaxy doubles its distance in the same time. And so therefore the speed of the yellow galaxy is twice the speed of the blue galaxy. That was the law that Hubble discovered. And it's, if you like, the first approximation. It turns out to be true. The details Hubble actually got wrong. Um, but that's another story, but we know that, in, that uh, in outline it all is correct. Now, what we have done since then is use these supernovae, their fluxes and their, uh, and their velocities and their speeds to not look not just at the speed, but to look at corrections to this law. And a very remarkable thing was discovered. What was discovered is perhaps shown here. If we look at, say, let me just go on. If we look at 10 billion years, we find the separation between our old white galaxy and the blue galaxy. And there's the yellow galaxy there. But just take a look at the white and the blue. In 10 billion years, that's the separation between the galaxies. I'm sort of reconstructing it as if we had some sort of celestial perch from which we could peer down on all of this. OK, but we can re by measurements, we can reconstruct this. After 12 billion years, it's increased. And so that separation has increased a bit. And after 14 billion years, which is more or less where we are now, not quite, but almost, then it's increased a bit more. And what we find is the increase in the separation 
from 10 to 12 billion years is less than the increase from 12 to 14 billion years. The speed is increasing. That's what we mean when we say that something is accelerating, the speed increases. And what we have found is quite contrary to our expectation, or for most of us our expectation, that the universe is accelerating. So, that's the second of our propositions, let's go on to the third. The universe is lightweight, what do I mean by that? Now I come to the third of my great mathematicians, Isaac Newton no less, and he invented the law of gravity. And what he observed was that gravity causes apples like this and the moon to accelerate. And it's the same law that works on apples falling off the tree in Wolfsthal and the moon going around the earth. They're both accelerating and gravity is doing its work on both of them. Now, this is encapsulated in Newton's law. In words, it basically says that force causes acceleration. It probably says that in Latin, if you go back to the Principia, but this is it in English. If you wanted to write a shorthand as an equation, you'd say the famous equation F equals MA. And notice the pre M stands for the mass, A for the acceleration, and F for the force. And what's important for my story is with that mass there, by looking at the planetary motion, this measures the mass of the Sun. So by measuring the acceleration of the planets as they change their, their velocity as they go around the sun, you measure the mass of the sun. Now we can, astronomer can go off and carry out an analogous experiment, not using planets, but using a distant cluster of galaxies. And this is what we have done. This is basically a, an accumulation of about a thousand galaxies. They're the yellow ones there. And we can measure their speeds and their distances using techniques like I've just described. And if we do this, we apply Newton's law, just the same as we did to the planets, and we find that the mass within this is basically about 600 trillion suns worth of mass. We measure the mass this way. I just want to say parenthetically, I want to draw your attention to this beautiful image from the Hubble Space Telescope. I want you to see all these gravitational lens arcs here, because I'll return to them later. Just observe them here. These long, elongated features. They're background galaxies whose images have been highly distorted. I'll return to this later by gravitational lensing. We'll see this a bit later. Okay, let me just move on. Clusters do not just contain galaxies and stars within those galaxies. They also contain a lot of hot gas. And we know about this and we can see it and we can measure it by measuring the x-rays that it creates. The hot gas creates x-rays and we're using x-ray telescopes like the Chandra x-ray telescope. We can study it in considerable detail. And we found something rather surprising that the mass of this gas, which is actually most of the mass in the cluster of galaxies, but we can also include the galaxies too, if we add, they say, the galaxies and the mass together, then it's about a hundred trillion suns. So the mass that we can see is only about one-sixth of the total that Newton's uh, laws told us should be there. And this phenomenon is also true of the individual galaxies themselves. So the conclusion is that five-sixths of the mass of the universe is not seen directly. This is the dark matter that Jonathan mentioned. So what I've done is say the universe is flat, accelerating, and lightweight. And I've done this in a rather deliberate way. I've presented you with the evidence and I haven't actually tried to put any interpretation on it. I've just presented you with the evidence. And I'd just like us to absorb that now. And uh, as I come from Southern California, um, it's natural at this time to have a commercial break um, or a message from our sponsors as this is sort of a higher quality operation. And the commercial break is um, that there will in fact be more unless you're all driven away uh, 
for by the quality of this lecture. There will be further lectures in this series to be enjoyed or suffered. Uh, this one will be a brilliant lecture, I know, because the lecture is very good, um, uh, on magnetism and x-rays from the compass to modern technology by Joachim Stur, who is here in the SSRL. And you can find out more about this inevitably on the web, and you can also sign up for a tour of Slack. So uh, please come along to that lecture too. I'm going to be here and it'll be a great lecture. Okay, so let's go on with the second half of my lecture. I presented you with the facts. Now I'm going to try and put some interpretation on it. And I've given you enough cautions about theorists that you can uh, take what I have to say with whatever pinches of salt or any other substance you may find helpful under these circumstances. I'll also sort of say, if you there's any doubt left in your mind that I know what I'm talking about, how we might explore these issues further. Okay, so I'm going to do this in reverse order. Let's deal with the proposition that the universe is lightweight. And we'll talk about the light and the dark. Basically what I've said is the galaxies that we see here, and these, this is a, actually one of the, this is the faintest image taken by Hubble Space Telescope, which you're actually seeing on the screen here. So, it should be treated with some reverence, this. Okay, so these galaxies here, the faintest galaxies that we have been able to see, are actually, what you're looking at there is the light. This is the light from the stars in those galaxies. But in fact, what we, what we know is that an individual, an individual galaxy, say with 10 billion suns, is surrounded by a halo, a much larger region, containing this dark matter that weighs about five times as much. So in every time you see one of those galaxies, you've got to imagine that invisible halo of dark matter around it. That is the dark matter. And in some sense, the stars are sort of insignificant afterthought in the real dynamics of, of the dark matter, which is really ruling the roost under these circumstances. This is true of all of these galaxies, and it's true, in fact, of the universe at large. In fact, dark matter is everywhere. This idea is not new. There are many precedents for it in the history of ideas, and one of the most famous is Manichaeism. In the third century, a Persian mystic called Mani uh, proposed a philosophy, a fusion of Christianity and Persian ideas. There was both a theology and a cosmology. He saw the universe as a mixture of light and dark stuff. And these represented to him good and evil. It, Manichaeism is an elaborate story with um, its fundamental elements in it are light, wind, fire, water, and breath. A little bit like what Aristotle said, but a little bit different. And all of this good stuff, the light, wind, water, fire, and breath, and all of that, is trapped by all the bad, dark stuff. And the light stuff has to escape to form an inert heaven and earth. And then sometime later in this story, in this cosmology, in the original sense of the word, life emerges still contaminated with the dark stuff, which is bad. This is really not a bad metaphor for what's going on here. Now, Manichaeism died out in the 13th century, although some claim that is having a revival at the present time. But we now think about this problem in a much more scientific way. There's, a, there's Manichaean art. If you look, I actually create a lot of beautiful art. Um, if you look at our, our new elements now, our elements, they would be fundamental particles. And the story that we tell now is called the standard model. We have here the neutrinos, the quarks, and the uh, particles that are meant to help them interact with one another. And uh, Slack, I might say parenthetically, had a big role in devising this standard model. Here's Dick Taylor and his part, Bert Richter and his, Marty Pearl and his. And of course, there's much more of this that has its uh, origin from local physicists. 
The standard model comprises a list of fundamental particles and their properties, and together with the rules for their engagement. And for 30 years, it has, it has withstood a ferocious experimental onslaught. Experimentalists have tried to knock holes in it, tried to bash it and change it, and they've frankly not been terribly successful. It's really stood up to a lot of um, uh, criticism and experimental tests. And all these measurements have been made, all these numbers are known to large numbers of significant figures. It really is a remarkable intellectual and technological achievement, and one that I don't think has been ever fully appreciated in the world at large. However, it's incomplete. There are many ways in which there are questions that are not answered by it, and it is quite possible that there are many more particles that are not included within these uh, in the standard model. Now, I'd like to draw your attention to the two classes that are here that are known as fermions and bosons. They're actually named after people, believe it or not. But these are fermions and bosons. And for present purposes, all you need to know is that bosons are very gregarious and friendly, the sort of people you'd like to meet, and fermions are the opposite. They're totally antisocial and uh, really quite unpleasant. But if you go beyond the standard model, there are many people who think, including myself, that there is a second family of supersymmetric particles out there in which, in some sort of gender-bending symmetry transformation, the quarks and the electrons become the bosons and the photons become the fermions. And so we have to give the different names like squarks and selectrons. And There's many ways for having jokes in this business. And so it could be that out there, not seen and not created by the present generation of particle accelerators, is this total new set of particles. And perhaps one of these, most favorite, something like a photino, is the dark matter. Now, if we carry this idea further as theorists and use what evidence we have from astronomy and from physics to try and guess where to look, we deduce that the mass is about the same as that of 100 protons. The average spacing will be about, in intergalactic space, about three meters between these particles. In this room, it'll be about five centimeters. Yuck. Okay, speed, a thousand times the speed of sound, roughly, or one thousandth the speed of light, if you prefer it. So, what are we doing about it? Well, the first thing is what the Swiss are doing about it. And the Swiss are, of course, the hosts of a large international collaboration that is building the Large Hadron Collider. And hadrons means protons. And here you have beams of protons, which are sent around at enormous speed and collided into each other. And one of the big hopes of these experiments, which will start in 2007, is that they will uncover the first direct evidence for supersymmetry. Now, slack doesn't do protons, but they do do electrons, and their partners positrons. And slack's role in this is to get involved in the linear collider which will be the next big accelerator that will um, uh, actually explore supersymmetry if it can be found uh, at the Large Hadron Collider, as many of us believe that it will. And so this is what the, super, the Linear Collider will do uh, here in about 2015. And many people here are working very hard on trying to design what again will be another of these great marvels, uh, the, the, the largest particle accelerator of its generation. There are other ways of exploring this. Right, there we go. It's possible to look for these particles directly. I've given the impression that they're quite inert. They are pretty inert, but not totally inert. And very occasionally, one of them will hit a regular atomic nucleus and create uh, an event which can be seen in a detector. You have to do this experiment to look for this underground. My colleague Blas Cabrera here uh, is leader of a team that is doing this deep down in mines. He's the one with the hard hat on, can't miss him. Um, and, and he's looking, we haven't found any yet, for dark matter particles colliding with normal matter. 
But there's a little bit of optimism that if they just dig deeper, as they used to say in the movies, um, then he will find one. There's a good chance that you will, that they will actually, there's a fair chance that they will find something. And so there may be, they may beat even the people at the particle accelerators. There's a bit of a race on. Another way that involves Slack and Stanford is to use the Gamma Ray Large Area Space Telescope. This is a telescope that should be launched in 2007. And um, it will have, look at gamma rays from many different sources. And one of the chances that it has is of finding indirectly the dark matter through the gamma rays that it might create when it collides with itself and it can actually create photons. This again is a bit of a rare event but gas may be able to see it. So those are the ways that we're trying to look for the dark matter particles and understand what it is. Let's go on to talk about why is the universe accelerating. And here, at long last, is the figure you've all been waiting for, Albert Einstein. Again, he's on his this time an Israeli banknote. Is there. Now Einstein is famous for many things, including especially the general theory of relativity. And in words, his great insight was that gravity is not a force, as Newton described it, but is actually a curvature. Not a space so much, but a space and time. And we call that space-time. It's four-dimensional, not three-dimensional space plus time. We call it space-time. And just like the surface of a sphere is a two-dimensional curved surface, there can be four-dimensional curved space-time. And what he proved, or postulated at that time, was that there was an equivalence between the curvature of space-time and the amount of matter in it or energy, their equivalent, that were around. And that's codified in this famous equation here, g equals 8 pi t in suitable units. Now, I'm not going to tell you what g is, but it's a measure of the space-time curvature of the gravity, if you like. 8 you might be worried about, but pi is about 3 and a bit. And t is a measure of the amount of mass and energy that you've got. Okay, so that's just the way we would think about it in terms of equations. Now, Einstein produced this theory, which has been tested. And its consequences have been measured to now better than um, uh, 100 parts per million. And so, uh, we, we have pretty good confidence that it's, um, this theory is correct, at least in the weak field limit. But there's no guarantee that is true on the scale of cosmology. And so, one of the things that is truly remarkable about Einstein was that he recognized, by pure thought, by symmetry, if you like, by applying a sort of symmetry-type argument, that the, in the cosmological scale, this equation shouldn't be just like that. We could add an extra bit to it. And it was the genius of Einstein to realize and to retain this possibility. He called it lambda, this term. It's known as lambda, the Greek letter lambda, or the cosmological constant. And he recognized on quite general grounds that that might be there and might be important for cosmology. Nowadays, we will call this stuff that this represented, this is if you like the amount of matter that we've got, we call that the uh, dark energy. That would be a sort of colloquial term for it now. Now if we go on and say, well what did they do? Einstein tried to create a cosmology. He hadn't met Hubble at that point, he didn't know the universe was expanding, and the, naturally enough the cosmology that he created was a static one. It had this lambda term here that was pushing out and gravity pulling in, there was just matter there, but everything was at rest. His Dutch contemporary, Willem de Sitter, in 1917, elucidated what this lambda was all about by making a cosmology in which there was no matter, it was a purely artificial thing, but there was motion. 
He was an astronomer. So Sidder, this is a meteorologist. This is a Russian meteorologist. This is a real ragbag of people here. Friedman, <laughs> matter and motion, completely independent of everybody. He worked all this stuff out by uh, a remarkable intellectual achievement with almost no stimulus from anybody outside. And he created models of the expanding universe that allowed for the universe to be expanding long before Hubble, that had matter and the motion there. And then finally, there was a Belgian priest called Georges Lemaitre. And he included matter and the cosmological constant as well and the motion. And sort of, sort of generalized, independent of Freeman. Nobody knew about Freeman at this time, these ideas. And this is if Fre uh, Lemaitre actually correcting one assumption that he made, which we no longer make, had really got the, the essence of what's going on correct. So what is this dark energy, this mysterious dark energy? I've tried to explain the dark matter is. The short answer is we don't know. But there is a simple version of it, the one that Einstein used, that at least will help us to think about the problem. And everything we know about it so far is consistent with the simple Einsteinian view, rather than a more general view which may still be possible. So I just take the simple Einstein view, and then basically this dark energy is always and everywhere the same. So as the universe expands, it remains the same. So what that means is that if the universe is expanding, we've created all this bigger space, the dark energy remains the same. We've got to create more energy. So we've got to replace the energy as it expands. That's a rather funny thing, because if you imagine letting the air out of a bicycle tire, that energy, will, that air will all cool off and it'll push against the surrounding gas and so on. If you think a moment about it, the only thing you can do is not have pressure like you have air in a bicycle tire, but you have tension. So, if you imagine a balloon, there's tension in two dimensions there on the surface of the balloon. If you imagine a rubber band like this, there's tension there in one dimension. What we have in this dark energy is tension in three dimensions. All right? So, there's tension and not pressure in this dark energy. That's a remarkable thing. And then there's an even more remarkable thing that happens. Is if you think through this through, is the combination of this tension in three dimensions and the energy, the dark energy itself, leads to a reversal of Newton's law. Instead of having an attraction, we get a repulsion. The famous string theorist and popularizer of science, Brian Greene, described this situation the way that only a New Yorker could. He said, we live in a pushy universe. <laughs> and eventually, if we let this have its way, the speed will go as a distance. Eventually. So Galileo the Scholastic may have known something after all. What is this dark energy? Well, we don't know. I've admitted that. But there are, of course, a thousand theories out there. The most simple and primitive is it is an energy associated with the vacuum. This is a perfectly reasonable idea. What is not reasonable is the amount of energy associated with it. It could be a new field, a bit like the magnetic field, but different. It could be something like that. Sometimes, in despair, physicists and astronomers will call it quintessence. They will hark back to our good friend Aristotle, who, of course, invented quintessence. He had earth, fire, air, and water, were his natural elements for the stuff like you and I. And then, to explain what was going on in the heavens, which he got all wrong, he had this mysterious ethereal stuff, which was called quintessence. Now, I think, really, probably the joke is on us, because... Uh, uh, we may be just as wrong-headed as Aristotle was in our attempts to understand what's going on. So maybe quintessence isn't a bad, a bad thing to, uh, to call it. So what are we going to do about this? Well, locally, we're very excited about a large telescope project called LSST. It's an 8-meter telescope, uh, and it will observe at a given time 50 moons worth of the sky. And it'll take a picture about every 10 seconds with 3 billion pixels. You won't get that from um, KBART. OK, and its main purpose is to look at gravitational lenses. It will have lots of other things it will do. 
And by studying these gravitational lenses, it will be able to measure the properties of the dark matter and the dark energy from an astronomical perspective. There's a second project called SNAP, which is a collaboration lead, led by our neighbors at the Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory. And we're very excited about this one too. It will be a complementary telescope that this time will be in space. It will be 2.5 meters. It will produce Hubble quality images go into the infrared, and its main purpose, and it will have many others as well, but its main purpose will be to look at those supernovae I told you about, so we can understand better the kinematics of the expanding universe. Let me turn to my final and last proposition, the one with which I started. Why is the universe flat? Well, there was in fact a theory. It was the theory called inflation. It was dreamt up by Alan Guth, who at that time was a postdoctoral fellow here at SLAC, and has been developed, probably as much assiduously as anybody, by my current colleague, a professor here at Stanford, Andre Linde. And basically, they proposed something really rather similar to dark energy, but operating in the very early times of the universe. They said there was a fundamental field there, which just like dark energy, called a very rapid acceleration, in which the speed went proportional to the distance. And the consequences of this inflation are quite, are quite simple. Firstly, there is a flat space. And the reason why, let me just show you here, is that if I <coughs> imagine a balloon like that, and then I just look at the surface, a small region on the surface of this balloon, say between my thumb and forefinger, you can see a lot of curvature there. But then if I expand it, you'll see there's much less curvature between my thumb and forefinger. Now I keep on expanding it many times over, over and over and over again. It must end up very, 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 very flat. I better not let it do that because the Big Bang is supposed to be before, not after the, <laughs> this race. Um, okay, it has other consequences. It has quantum effects associated with inflation, and these cause tiny fluctuations. Those are the fluctuations out of which the galaxies grew, and you and I developed. So we have a personal interest in this. And those fluctuations create this microwave background, stippling or ripples. And they will also create some gravitational radiation, some ripples in space-time itself. And here, we can uh, perform lots more experiments to look for the ripples in the microwave background of a special sort that are polarized and would be a, um, a hallmark of the gravitational radiation from the earliest time in the universe, perhaps from the epoch of inflation. And my colleague here, Sarah Church, is soon to go to the South Pole with her telescope and will um, look at these fluctuations and look for the polarization in them. Polarization like you see with polarized, sun, polarized, sun, polarizing sunglasses, polaroid sunglasses. And she's looking for a very special pattern, which maybe this experiment or some successor experiment will see, which will be a telltale signature of the time of inflation. We don't know what we're going to find, but it's a very exciting prospect that's engaged upon. The other way to do this, and this is a much longer shot, is to see this, these ripples in space-time from the earliest stage of the universe directly. This will be very hard, but it's something that people at least are dreaming about at the moment. A step along the way is a project that my colleagues in applied physics, Bob Bollig, my Bayer and his colleagues, have been working on for some time to measure this gravitational, radi gravitational radiation, not from cosmological sources, but produced by um, orbiting black holes and similar types of object. So this is a pretty uh, sort of exciting time to be around and contemplating the, this activity. So what I've tried to show you in this talk is the universe is flat, accelerating, and lightweight. <coughs> My time is almost up, and I've tried to explain these simple propositions to you. 
I've tried to show you why we now believe them to be true and to present some of the most popular, at least, theoretical explanations of what is going on. I've also tried to outline some of the very exciting projects, many of which we're involved in here at Stanford, that we hope will test these theories. It's a wonderful story that I think I've been able to tell you, and I hope I've been able to communicate it to you. I have to say I feel highly privileged to be around and working at a point in space-time where so much is being discovered. Now, in preparing this lecture, I've been impressed that for all the technological sophistication of contemporary telescopes and the austere beauty of modern theoretical physics, most of the ideas that I have described to you have deep roots in our culture. The geometry can be traced back to the Greeks, the kinematics and the dynamics to the Renaissance, and our invocation of dark matter and dark energy would hardly surprise an unbroken chain of philosophers, priests, and mystics stretching back to the dawn of recorded thought. I think that uh, as we contemplate a universe that um, promises us expansion, a sort of cosmic alienation, and eventual decay, the fact that earlier generations have found the exploration of these ideas both exciting and fulfilling is a thought that I personally find comforting. I hope you do too. Thank you very much indeed. No, I was looking at the clock, which is not right. This is a relativity talk, so we're out. <laughs> I'm glad you asked that question. This is why I love this stuff. Okay, here is the Hubble, is the Hubble, um, a deep field seen by the Hubble Space Telescope. I get the field. If you put a gravitational lens in front of it, which is a sort of galaxy like that, you can hold it like that. Great. Um, then you can see. I think those are in the front. And you can come and look at this later. You can see. It creates distortions, in particular tangential elongations of these background images. We can do this later. If you want to do this at home, then you can take a, a wine glass like that and just stick it down on some tight script like this and just look at it and you'll see exactly the same effect. I advise you to drain the wine glass first. <laughs> <laughs> um, these, this is the effect. And basically what's happening is the force of gravity pulls on those photons in the light and deflects their rays just in an analogous way to what is this plexiglass uh, is doing. In fact, it has a gravitational field, effectively has a refractive index for those of you who know some of this. And so we, the same sort of optics that we use to design telescopes and electron lenses and so on applies to gravitational lenses. And we use this now not so much as a theory, but as a tool. It's a tool for measurement. It is a tool for measurement of distances. It is a tool for measurement of mass. Because the amount of energy depends on the amount of mass. And it turns out that when I showed you that cluster of galaxies, there are several ways of measuring the mass. We can count up the amount of mass associated with the emitting X-rays in the stars. We can also count up the um, the mass associated with the moving galaxies, and then we can count up the mass estimated by the gravitational lenses. And the story is all consistent now. There's basically five times as much dark matter there as there is luminous matter. So thank you very much for asking that question. OK, what question there? Um, I always hear this, when something's trying to explain what dark matter is, it's contrast to what isn't dark matter. That, that compared to the sun, I think you said too, the sun is luminescent. 
well, the Earth is a luminous. Does that make the Earth dark matter? Again, a very good question, drawing out a point that I did not have time to discuss. Thank you. Uh, basically, when we talk about the regular stuff, it's the stuff of you and I, mostly the protons and the electrons and the neutrons, the atoms that we're sort of familiar with, uh, and it's the sun stuff in the in the sun, in the earth, in the planets, in the gas, in the in the um, in the atmosphere and in the uh, in the planetary media. That is the stuff we know about. It may not all be luminous, but for astronomer, we measure it by its luminosity because most of it is in the form of either hot gas or stars. So we measure it by because most of it does in fact glow in these conditions. But around us. I mean, we didn't want it to be glowing around us. We couldn't find it, but we get some of it very easily. Okay. Uh, so, um, we wouldn't want to be a 100 million degree environment. Um, but the, uh, so we, we talk about it as light, because in practice, to an astronomer, it is light. Most of it is luminous. But around us, we're in a very little cool pocket on the surface of the Earth. So, in fact, that's why we can exist here. We do have chemistry going on, biochemistry, and all the rest of it. Now, the other stuff is totally, we think, we're not sure, okay, but our theory is this is a totally different set of particles that are related to the ones that you and I are made of, but they're different. Their interaction is only really strongly by gravity. They do have a very weak interaction by hitting one another very occasionally, but mostly it's just by gravity. And this is this sort of nether world, this Manichaean dark side, or Star Wars, or whatever you want. Okay? And that's the contrast that's there. And if this theory is right, there would be a very clear distinction in particle physics. But it could be wrong. One of my friends has a laboratory in which he says, um, uh, I'm sorry, welcome to my laboratory, the place where theories come to die. So, <laughs> like Alton Dorford, uh, when confronted with theories. It's a very good tension to have in science. Question. Okay, last question up there. Last question. During we have more questions outside afterwards, but yeah. During the hope of finding out which direction in our universe the Big Bang is in relation to us, <laughs> or is the universe too large to try to find out? Um, Okay, uh, that's a big one of answer. Uh, let's see you afterwards. Okay, basically, it's in, it, the universe is expanding in all directions as far as we can see. There's no sort of obvious center that we're looking right, for. Right, but if there was one Big Bang, we're somewhere in relation to that Big Bang. Yeah, it, it, it could have been like that. The world could have been like that. The, the world that we describe is not like that. As far as we're concerned, this is like we're a tiny, what we're accessible to is a tiny bit of that as far as we're concerned, so that spherical surface there, just as a two-dimensional surface, has no centre. The bit that we can see. Okay, thank you very much indeed.